Ultimately, while assembling the Scribner Anthology of Contemporary Short Fiction, Michael Martone and I tried not just to democratize the selection of stories by requesting nominations of stories from well-known teaching writers, but also to represent the widest variety of genre innovations reflected in both traditional and non-traditional stories. In doing so, we included such contemporary realists as Richard Bausch, Annie Prue, Charles Baxter, Richard Ford, Steve Yarbrough, Julie Oranger, and Anthony Doerr. As well as such contemporary fabulous as Dennis Johnson, Robert Olin Butler, Kevin Brockmeyer, Stacy Richter, and Kelly Link. We included representatives of postmodern satire such as Donald Barthelme, A. M. Holm, and George Saunders. We included stories that showed a wide variety of technical innovations, innovations in voice by such writers as Stuart Dybeck, who uses negative repetition to tell a story about love, Tom Jones, whose almost manic storytelling boxer narrator creates a voice unlike any other, Mary Hood's deeply lyrical southern voice describing generational conflict, or the almost poetic and lyrical voice of Amy Bloom's narrator who recounts the life of a sister lost to mental illness. We included a wide variety of stories that show remarkable innovations in point of view, as in Russell Banks' story, told in both first and third person by an unreliable narrator at least partly aware of his own unreliability or in Susan Sontag's story, which uses the constantly shifting points of view of people who gossip, a kind of collage of dialogue passed between friends who must all watch a friend they love die of AIDS. Or in David Mean's story, told in part by a recent divorcee, but also told from the point of view of a goldfish disappearing behind a curtain of green algae and muck or in Dagoberto Gilb's story told from two completely different points of view, a man and a woman's, two people who've never met but who both see themselves as losers, which alternate between sections until the characters accidentally meet in Las Vegas and begin to win together, their points of view merging at the end, alternating between one paragraph and the next. We also included stories which illustrate remarkable innovations in structure. Two short short stories, Girl and Boys, which work as a kind of counterpoint to each other, using a mix of dialogue and internal monologue, as well as innovations in setting, stories which use landscape itself as a kind of antagonist and extended metaphor. We also included stories by such diverse multinational and multicultural voices as Juno Diaz, Zizi Packer, Bharati Mukherjee, Leslie Marmon Silko, Jumpa Lahiri, Peter Ho Davies, and Amy Tan. And of course, we included stories that deal with a wide variety of contemporary issues and themes. AIDS, homelessness, racism, sexism, sexuality, terrorism, and war. We hope these stories will infect students, writers, and readers, making them as infatuated by the contemporary short story form as we are, teaching developing fiction writers new ways of thinking about the contemporary short story form the varied ways of writing short stories, and ultimately giving students and writers permission to take risks and to experiment with form without fear of making mistakes. And perhaps, if readers, writers, and students read stories that transform the ways they look at contemporary stories, perhaps too, they'll begin reading the collections of stories, both linked and novels and stories, written by these authors and others, which have helped transform the contemporary short story form Louise Erdrich's Love Medicine, Tim O'Brien's The Things They Carried, Sandra Cisneros' Woman Hollering Creek, 
Sherman Alexie's The Lone Ranger and Tonto Fist Fight in Heaven, Richard Ford's Rock Springs, Annie Prue's Close Range, A. M. Holmes The Safety of Objects, Robert Olin Butler's Tabloid Dreams, Julie Oranger's How to Breathe Under Water, Rick Moody's Demonology, Deborah Eisenberg's All Around Atlantis, Amy Bloom's Come to Me, and many, many others. And who knows, maybe writers reading these collections will write their own collections of stories, linked stories and novels and stories, and maybe they'll become accidental anthologists, too. Before we end our discussion of the contemporary short story, let's shift now to the sources, markets, and methods contemporary fiction writers use to send their stories out for publication. First, we'll discuss the contemporary short story market. I don't care much for the word market, since quality literary short stories are hardly the equivalent of Big Macs and stock market derivatives, but we'll have to make do with the word anyway. If you're interested in the subject of the commodification of art and art as a part of gift cultures rather than commodity cultures, I highly recommend reading Lewis Hyde's The Gift. Second, we'll discuss in some length a wide variety of literary magazines, many of which I've ranked just to give you a sense of what I consider to be the top-tier magazines. Of course, my rankings are not so much about whether magazines are good or bad as whether they're magazines many writers have the greatest respect for and wish to publish in themselves. Third, we'll focus a bit on some of the supplements I make available to my students to help them publish. Supplements I've designed and tweaked and used for years to submit and track stories, rejections, and acceptances. I like to think of the process in this way. I don't worry so much about getting a story accepted. What I'm interested in is collecting as many rejection slips as possible. The more I get, the more likely I am to stubbornly rethink, revise, and send a story out again. At one point during graduate school, I actually tacked rejection slips to my bathroom walls until they were covered. <laughs> it was a way of thumbing my nose at rejection while not losing the real focus of continuing to work on stories until they're publishable or until they reach the right magazine, the right editor, for the work I'm doing. In many ways, publishing writers must nurture two sides of themselves, the parts that dream and write and revise stories again and again, and the parts that deal with the world, the business-like, professional parts of ourselves that send the work out into the world and never give up. Persistence, of course, is everything. As I've suggested so far, the more contemporary fiction you read, the more professional and publishable your own fiction may become, and the more familiar you'll be with the best venues for publishing your own fiction. Perhaps the most up-to-date print publication for finding magazines that best suit your own fiction is the novel and short story writer's market. Unfortunately, writer's market tends to see writing as a kind of commodity, and its advice may seem cheesy at times targeted more to writers of romance novels, it seems, than to writers of quality literary fiction. But, Writer's Market does have excellent advice for writers, and it's worth reading the articles published in the annual that most suit your needs. What's most important is to take what you can use from the book and website and ignore the rest. While you may also buy the more wide-reaching Writer's Market, it's more expensive than the novel and short story writer's market, and it often covers material far broader than the material you'll need in sending fiction off for publication. Novel and short story writer's market includes much more than the addresses of literary magazines or slicks. It also includes articles on writing fiction, interviews with writers, resources, including book publishers, literary agents, contests and awards, and conferences and workshops all useful places to research as a writer builds her career. An excellent source for so-called small literary magazines is the International Directory of Little Magazines and Small Presses, which, may also, which you may also buy on CD-ROM at www.dustbooks.com. Just because many magazines are small or have a small circulation doesn't mean that they're of lower quality. In fact, little magazines are sometimes the best place to place your fiction. I like to begin sending stories at the top tier of the magazines I want to send to, but I work my way down to others, including magazines that may have small circulations but excellent reputations. 
The main advantages of the annual novel and short story writers market are that the latest annual edition also includes with it a free subscription to writersmarket.com which includes detailed searchable databases for literary and other magazines as well as a submission tracker. And because it also contains the most detailed descriptions of magazines anywhere I know of, writers just beginning to submit their work may get a real sense of which of their stories may be most suitable for which publication. Of course, it's also a good idea to buy back issues of the magazine for a reduced price so that you may read them more co closely. One of the biggest mistakes writers can make is sending their work to a magazine they've never read or to a magazine that doesn't even read fiction or stories like the ones they've written. All the more reason to look closely at magazines and to be aware of what editors are looking for. Fortunately, literary magazines are sometimes available in such stores as Barnes & Noble and in most college libraries under current serial publication sections. I've spent countless hours in universities across the U.S. picking up literary magazines I've never seen and sampling them or choosing the latest editions of the magazines I respect and love. The example entry listed above, the Southern Review, cited in the Novel and Short Story Writers Market 2011, for example, is one of the most well-respected literary magazines in the U.S., and the Novel and Short Story Writers Market lists symbols in its first few pages which describe in shorthand the publication's main focus. The first symbol shows that the magazine pays $30 per page. The second shows that the magazine seeks new and established writers, a terrific place to showcase your own work alongside that of other more well-known authors. The third, that it's an award-winning magazine. When I published my first story in the Southern Review, I was just a second-year MFA, a schlump, painting apartments for the Arkansas Housing Authority and working summers to write and help pay for grad school without having to take on too much student debt. When I showed the cover of the magazine with Woye Soyinka on, front, on the front to my co-workers, all wearing paint-smudged coveralls like mine, I said, Hey, this guy won the Nobel Prize, <laughs> as if I were next in line to win the prize myself. I'm sad to say that the editor listed here, Jenny Leiby, one of my most gifted former MFA students at the University of Alabama when I taught there in the 90s, recently died in a car crash. Just a few weeks after the 2011 Writer's Market came out. My former students have gone on to edit such terrific magazines as the Southern Review, the Gettysburg Review, the Florida Review, the New Orleans Review, the Idaho Review, and the Rio Grande Review. I still try not to send stories to magazines where I know the editors, but I'm finding that harder and harder to do. And losing Jeannie one of the most well-respected editors and promising young writers in the U.S. She published her first novel just months before she died. It was a terrible loss. Because buying a copy of the annual novel and short story Writer's Market includes with it a free yearly subscription to writersmarket.com, writers may save themselves time searching detailed databases for literary and slick magazines. And they may also use the Writer's Market Submission Tracker, shown above, to keep track of all the stories they've got in the mail. I also include a free submission tracker for my students, basically an Excel spreadsheet in the supplements for this class, but it's not as sophisticated as the one in writersmarket.com, which of course comes at a price. The graphic listed above shows the first page of a search I made on writersmarket.com, under the keywords short short story, including both literary magazines and writing contests. As this graphic shows, writersmarket.com lists a total of 78 entries. Some of them include reading fees, something I discourage students from paying unless a magazine is well known and well respected. Publishers should pay writers and not the other way around, right? But clearly this number is encouraging for writers who write short short fiction as I do. And some of these venues are new to me, worthy of investigation.